me the old timer around here. Been a long time since I first rode into the panhandle. Yep, a long time when it's reckoned in years. Guess they're right. An old timer in a young, brand new country, the Texas panhandle. Even in my younger days, plenty of years ago, this stretch in northwest Texas was high, wide, and handsome. You could pick any spot in it, look off in any direction, and see nothing but grass and cattle. I was a cowpoke then, except for a few others like me, the only sign of life in those days was steers, plenty of them. Don't need many hands to raise cattle. And in the old days, say some 30, 40 years back, this was all cattle country, not people country. But people started coming when they found out Panhandle soil was good for more than a grass crop the year round. Up till the end of the last war, this was almost 100% wheat crop country. That is, in dollars took in. Years ago, a wheat crop failure meant money failure. But now, if the wheat crop's bad, the farmers can still make a profit by leasing their land for cattle to graze on and planting row crops. And now it's going to surprise plenty of folks when I tell them this. There's more money coming to the Texas farmers from sorghum grain than from wheat. It's a fact. Planting sorghum's getting bigger business year by year. And that ain't all. For sorghums, there's nothing like panhandle soil, climate, and moisture. Besides cattle, wheat, cotton, and sorghum in this big territory, we got other money crops. For instance, fruits, cantaloupes, vegetables, potatoes, and lots of other crops. Thousands of square miles of them. Irrigation helped make that possible, and electric pumping is best for irrigation. There's more than two million acres under irrigation here in West Texas, and all of the land in the Pecos Valley in New Mexico is irrigated. Speaking of other crops, take cotton, for example. Big acreage in the Pecos Valley, New Mexico, and around Plainview and Lubbock. Fact is, Lubbock is the third largest inland cotton market in the United States. Grain crops mean money returns in other ways. Mills and elevators for storage and processing, gins and cotton oil plants, canning plants and shipping sheds, it all adds up to a mighty big sum. My cowpoke range riding days are over, and there's a new kind of range rider. He don't herd cattle and he don't ride horses, but he herds kilowatts for an outfit called Southwestern Public Service Company, which has been doing business in these parts for over 27 years. Their SPS brand is respected by us folks. Brands have to earn good reputations here on the plains. I remember that in 42, the Southwestern Public Service Company outfit bought out neighbor outfits, and now their territory is big, 45,000 square miles. And there's much more than cows and crops on it these days. There's industry, commerce, and underground wealth. Yep, it's the stuff deep under the surface of the earth that's got the panhandle busting out of its britches. The oil and gas that count up into the millions. The boom days are not so long ago when oil was new around here. I remember them well. Rip roaring was the word. But now it's settled down real businesslike. Nothing flashy no more, but good steady puller. That's panhandle oil. You don't need to be an old timer to see the changes in the scenery around here like these big refineries that take the crude oil and turn it into gasoline, motor oil, all kinds of chemicals, carbon black, synthetic rubber, the new plastics, and all kinds of other things that sell all over the country and in foreign countries. Back in the early days, they had no use for the natural gas, no way to harness it or get it to where it'd do some good. Something of a nuisance, so they just let it flare off. But not today, when there's big pipelines running in all directions, 
from the biggest natural gas field in the world. Old timer, let me put in a word about oil allowables here. Since the Iranian situation has developed, the Texas oil allowables have increased. The West Texas fields gain a big advantage here because the recovery percentage remains high in these fields even though a larger amount of oil is being removed. It's like you said earlier, there's nothing flashy about the panhandle oil industry. It's just a steady puller, and it's pulling mighty good now when we need all the production we can get. But oil and gas are not the only money crops we're getting from underground these days. There's a new product out here, potash. More potash here than any other single place in the world in the Pecos Valley around Carlsbad, New Mexico at the southwest end of the territory. These potash mines are big business. And it looks like to get bigger and bigger business, the more and more uses they find for the stuff. In addition to industries, which have become basic in the economy of the territory, there are many new aspects of industrial development. Synthetic rubber, as exemplified by this great plant. A phase of industrial pioneering of vital importance to the nation in these days of international tension. New chemical and plastic plants. The spurt in the manufacture of farm machinery. These and other recent industrial and diversified enterprises are guideposts pointing the way to continued and ever increasing progress and prosperity for the territory as a whole. And for those who have a stake in its future its citizens whose homes are here and who work here, and for outside forces whose primary interest is financial investment. Speaking of the people who live and work here puts me in mind of something I came across just recently. To wit and whereas, from 1940 to 1950, last census, the 15 biggest cities in the territory went up 76% in population and still going strong. Places like Lubbock, Plainview, Amarillo, Roswell, Pampa, Borger, Clovis, and more like them are up-to-date cities, all with excellent air, bus, and rail transportation facilities. Reading habits have sure changed out here, too, since people got interested in industry and business as well as agriculture. It used to be you might see a drover's journal now and then, or the weekly edition of the Kansas City Star. Nowadays, though, the largest per capita circulation of the Wall Street Journal is right in Amarillo, Texas. These folks know what's going on in business. They got an interest in it, a dollar interest, too. Yep, the past has been mighty good to this part of the country. But strictly speaking, this is a region of the future. We're a young country out this way, like these school kids of ours. These college boys at Texas Tech, New Mexico Military Institute, West Texas State College, Amarillo College, and Wayland College. These days, there's many a man worrying about the future. But not us out here in Southwestern's territory. We're looking forward to it, and we're building to it. Along the Canadian River, about 20 miles north of Amarillo, a dam which will hold a million and a half acre feet of water has been authorized by Congress. Southwestern's management has worked enthusiastically with the civic leaders in planning this installation. The company's primary interest is seeing that the territory has an adequate surface reservoir of water for all purposes. Such a water supply will be a further guarantee of adequate condensing water for the company's generating plants. And the company also expects to furnish substantial amounts of electric power for pumping the water through the planned 275-mile distribution pipeline. Today, the company system consists of 10 base-load steam generating stations, interconnected by over 3,000 miles of high-tension transmission lines. 
Now under construction, and to be by far the largest generating plant in the entire system, is Plant X, out on the open prairie, located near the little town of Earth, Texas. At first sight, located in the middle of nowhere, Plant X is actually in the middle of everything, situated at the company's load center, adjacent to a large natural gas pipeline which will supply fuel, and also adjacent to a large underground water reservoir overladen by sand hills, which catch precipitation and recharge the reservoir. Southwestern has purchased perpetual water rights on 10,000 acres of this land. When the second unit goes on the line at Plant X in 1953, this one plant will be larger than was Southwestern's entire system generating capacity in 1943. The growth in population and the application of electric service to agriculture and industries has brought about a remarkable increase in the use of electric power. The number of customers has more than doubled over the past nine years. The peak load of Southwestern's present interconnected system has increased every year for nine years, reaching a high of 338,500 kilowatts in August 1951. Increased demands for electric power call for increased generating capacity. In eight years, generating capacity has been increased more than 216%. Projected increases now under construction or planned will increase capacity to 526,100 kilowatts by August 31st, 1953, nearly 50% more than today's capacity. Gross plant account has increased from approximately $30,500,000 in 1942 to $115,000,000 in 1951, or 277%. And it is estimated that by the end of August 1954, there will be a further increase of 54% over this year's figure. As a result of the rapid expansion to keep pace with the growth of the area served, approximately two-thirds of Southwestern's plant and property at the end of August 1951 represented new equipment installed within the preceding five years, most of it within the last three years. As a result, the company is believed to have one of the highest percentages of new electric facilities. As seen from this chart, gross electric operating revenues from Southwestern's presently interconnected system have been rising steadily for nine years, best indication of the growth and development of the area the company serves. The average rate of increase for the nine years shown is more than 15% a year. Keeping pace with the rapidly developing area it serves has been Southwestern's responsibility. But it has also been good business, as attested by the increase in earnings for the company's common stock. From $1,084,000 in 1943 to $4,370,000 in 1951. Southwestern's family is growing too, with more than 14,000 common stockholders in every state and several foreign countries. Following the two-for-one split of the shares in August 1950, the resulting reduction in the market level has produced a substantial broadening of the market. So much for the past, but more important still is the future. Here are some of the industrial plants in the territory which are expanding to meet the war effort since fighting began in Korea. Phillips Petroleum at Borger, the Cabot Company at Pampa, Duval Sulphur and Potash at Carlsbad. Southwest Potash and U.S. Potash at the same place. International Minerals and Chemicals at Carlsbad. And here at Lubbock, Anderson Clayton is installing a new project. The Amarillo Air Force Base is being reactivated and expanded. Salonese Corporation is installing a new chemical plant at Pampa. These and other new loads in the territory are estimated to equal a total additional demand of over 47,000 kilowatts. The judgment of Southwestern's management as to the need for the power which these facilities will produce 
has been confirmed by the granting to Southwestern of certificates of necessity to amortize substantial portions of the cost of these generating units over a five-year period for federal income tax purposes. This is Southwestern's load dispatching center, the vibrant heart of the system located at the system headquarters in the public service building in downtown Amarillo. Planning, the type of planning which has been so typical of Southwestern's growth, has made this central load dispatching center unique. The telemeters you see here were employed on such a large scale for the first time at this installation. Here at a glance, the dispatcher has all the vital information necessary for successful operation of the system. He has instantaneous carrier circuit telephone communication with each or all of the 10 base load power plants. On this system diagram, the operator sees all his transmission circuits and can quickly and efficiently reroute the flow of current should emergencies or maintenance make this necessary. Yes, and there's room here too for future expansion. Room for plant X, for example. This load dispatching center was planned plan to bring Southwestern's customers the best in electric service. Well, that's pretty much the story right up to now. But like I said, the best part of the Southwestern story is yet to be told. It's a story that's in the making right now, working itself out in the years ahead. When I come riding into this country, there was just range riders and cattle. Today, there's somebody new riding the ranges, a fella in red. Reddy Kilowatt, they call him. Just a little fella, but he's riding about 500,000 horses along those high-powered transmission lines. Yep, that's the horsepower Southwestern generates in its electric machine, and growing more and more every year, in war and peacetime so that one of the fastest growing regions in the whole USA can keep on growing. That's Southwestern, bringing light and power to this big territory. That's Reddy Kilowatt, like the cowpokes in the old days, riding high, wide, and handsome.